But now you have uh, Syria as the objective, as collectively, for humanitarian aid, which later became the boilerplate for organized political activity. So let me circulate this around. So you can see that it was um, centered in Highland Park, uh, near Detroit, Michigan, in Arabic, in the upper right corner. What's in English? Great. On the other side is the, the um, three-month um, uh, report of the activities of the new Syria party. So this Syrian Wounded Veterans Relief Committee became the new Syria party. So the Palestine National League fell in line behind this organization, and those guys were able to send three and a half million dollars in today's money in aid for their countrymen. Again, don't start reading the whole thing. <laughs> uh, if you can read Arabic, that is. So, uh, so this was a major political effort. Those guys had chapters all over the country, were highly organized, very effective. And that was our first lobbying Arab American group. So one can digress and talk about structural integration. This is really important because if you belong to a PTA, if you belong to a union or an organization like this, you're actually inching closer towards integration into U.S. society. Yeah? And that is the start of an effort that will bring us very close to the center of power in this country. That will uh, run its course by World War II, as I will share with you in a minute. So, and this is uh, the New York chapter of the year the new Syria party. So, the Palestine National League then went into action on behalf of Syria as part of the new Syria party. The same people, by the way. Could not tell them apart. And then the Great Depression hit, 1929 to 1939. Things were really rough. In between something, another uprising took place, actually a revolution. So the Great Syrian Revolution, 1925, was put down by 1927. We're no match for the Europeans. I mean, one French division will have more firepower than all Arab armies put together. We're under occupation, you have to understand that. In the interwar period, the Zionist uh, groups, the gangs in Palestine, were doing their worst and building weapons factories underground with Polish support and Eastern uh, European support, massive support. So they had about 70 to 80,000 people under arms, well armed, by the way. So that sh we should not uh, lose sight of that. And the Palestinians fell on really hard time. They could not get jobs. The, the peasants were squeezed out of their jobs. Uh, and then they um, revolted, 1936. They had an, a strike that lasted for 11 months, devastated the Palestinian uh, economy. But they, that's when Azadin al-Qassam was killed by the British, if you've heard the name before. Uh, by the way, Azadin al-Qassam, just to give you an idea about the connectedness of all of Syria, is Syrian, not Palestinian. But he, is, he became the premier martyr for the Palestinians at the time. So during that time, the same people organized themselves and established what is called the Arab National League. 19... 1936, as a response to the Palestinian revolt. New Syria Party, Syrian revolt, 1925. The Arab National League, a response to the uh, revolt in uh, Palestine in 1936. The Arab National League, and I can make this statement very comfortably, had a minimum of 15,000 members per capita, making it by far the largest Arab American grassroots organization. Yeah? Um, um, this is a big statement because it, ha it was a formal organization, fairly sophisticated. It issued a lot of pamphlets to raise public awareness about Syria in general and the Palestinians' problem in Palestine. Um, and began to lobbying effort systematically, that is to say letter writing. They had four national conventions. By 1939, something very important happened that basically cemented Arab American identity as you know it today. So, 
upstairs in the museum and not to detract from the importance of this place. It's a wonderful space. I bring my students here and every guest I get, I, we end up here very often. We're proud of the museum, but the information, of, of course, is evolves and always uh, stands some improvement and updating, right? So, whereas upstairs it says on the wall to this day that, you know, uh, until 1967 there were no Arab American political organizations, now you heard about three of them, right? But here is the critical part <coughs> in terms of identity development for Arab Americans. There is something in immigration studies called Anglo conformity or the melting pot. The melting pot, we use it uncritically, that term. I, I don't like it very much because you basically have to mutate into something you are not in order to fit in against an Anglo model. You have to be as white as possible, but as we know, we cannot be white enough. This is the essence of racism in this country. Uh, although some, you know, uh, some of the Syrian immigrants squeaked by, they looked white enough and based on their merit, and they actually, uh, one of those court cases, they argued, hey, um, Jews are white in your eyes, and they're Semites. We're Semites, therefore we, we must be white. This is one of the arguments that, that were used at the time. Nevertheless, Anglo conformity kind of ran its course. This is around World War One, 100% Americanism. You have to be, to give up who you are in order to become this new creature, an American creature, yeah? Um, there was something called cultural pluralism. We credit Horace Callan with that. I give the credit to the person who came up with this concept uh, and developed it. His name is Amin Rihani. He is a, m a founding member of Ar Rabat Al Qalamiya, or the Pen Bond, in 1916, which was relaunched -la again in 1920. Amin Rihani wrote a booklet called Letters to Uncle Sam. And he told the government, hey, I'm your downtrodden son, you know, don't forget about me, I'm loyal to this country. And he actually recruited more people to, to fight in World War I than anyone else, by the way. And Arab Americans raised, sold more war bonds in both world wars per capita than any other immigrant group. More Arab Americans served in World War I per capita than any other immigrant group, by the way. And they did not do it for citizenship. They wanted to kick the, the uh, Ottomans behind and... Uh, free Syria. Uh, that, that was their motivation. So, so, but the new concept, this, the, the emergent concept at the time of cultural pluralism, found its way in the sun around World War II. I'm still trying to describe how we became Arab Americans. In the context of political activities within, as members of the Arab National League, cultural pluralism says that you can be, remain Syrian, Arab, Jordanian, Polish, Italian, um, Russian, and still be American. By then you have, you know, structural integration was full swing. People served in, world, in both world wars, their kids went to school and then to college, and they belonged in unions. I mean, they forged a life here. But they didn't want to give up who they are uh, uh, regarding their heritage. They did not want to give up their heritage attachment. So, but now after World War II, the Americans basically, the hostility between Protestants and Catholics, which is, was very, very violent, kind of began to dissipate somewhat. Uh, Catholics, Protestants, and Jews began to get along. And Arab Americans in the fourth national convention of the Arab National League uh, in September of that year, because World War II started in Europe, Germany invaded Poland in September, during the convention, they said, okay, this is getting really serious. We have to make up our minds and define our uh, identity on our own terms. So they decided, they began to talk of themselves as Arab Americans. In the fourth national convention of the Arab National League in Flint, Michigan, a young lawyer stood up, his name is Yusuf Yusuf, and he said, I am a proud Arab, but I'm also a citizen of this country. And, and uh, a visiting uh, dignitary, actually, two visiting dignitaries, really important people who died that same weekend in a car crash. Um, um, Khalil al-Sheikh and Mufarraj, I forget his first name, the, the other fellow. He commented that, I am really impressed with you, that you are 
Arab Americans, not merely Arabs in America. That was the birthing moment for Arab American identity, 1939, September, which was in the making for years, not 1967. So if we can agree on that, we have a lot to build on. And our demands, I mean, what you, the plea you heard uh, from Nada still stands, that we still yearn to a country of our own. I hope it's still all of Syria, not just part of it. So Arab Americans began to think uh, pragmatically, and they said, OK, World War II started. They suspended operations, and they joined the war effort. Again, they fought for this country. And after the war, they wanted to reap the benefit of this, you know, uh, victory of World War II, and they established what's called the Institute of Arab American Affairs. The Institute of Arab American Affairs, founded in 1944 by more or less the same people, uh, sought to represent U.S. interests in the Middle East. Yeah, those guys really had a stake in this country. That organization was large, sophisticated, issued many papers on Palestine, criticized Zionism as a focus, um, and had within its members Kermit Roosevelt, the grandson of Theodore Roosevelt himself, but also uh, William Hawking, a Harvard uh, philosopher, very famous guy. Even the Arab National League had within its ranks, you know, a lot of dignitaries, including Eliyahu Grant, a, a very famous um, archaeologist. So those guys became integrated in American life and began to have a say in foreign policy, sort of, so, so to speak. However, Zionism was actually gaining in power, and the Zionists were able to pull off the establishment of their state in Palestine with American support. So we had a double whammy, which kind of repeats itself. I don't know how much time I have, uh, Wissam. I don't want to 